So Switzerland has been allowed back into the European research funding Horizon 2020. The government has accepted the free movement of people despite a referendum. What does that mean for ETR itself and of course for Switzerland as a whole in terms of its higher education system? To ETR and all of my colleagues in the university system, this is a big step forward. It's a big relief. We were very scared to be excluded from this important network in the European Union. It is not just the money, of course the money is also important. It is really being part of a system that is moving forward and it would have, uh, it would have rendered our life much more difficult if it would have been excluded. I'm very grateful that the politicians in Switzerland but also all academics have worked along one line to make it possible that we are back in Horizon 2020. And this week we've had the British Prime Minister Theresa May spelling out her terms for a Brexit, Britain's exit from the European Union. Clearly there's a strong anti-immigration sentiment there, there's a rejection of the free movement of people. What does that mean for the rest of Europe if Britain is isolating itself from the European talent pool? I mean there are two sides of this coin. One side is the position of the British universities and this is a difficult one. I know that very well because we were in that position for a period of time. And I, I sympathize with my colleagues there and I will be very open to discuss any options how we can help them. Then the other side of the coin is the partners on the other side, on the European side. For them it's also not a good situation because we will lose contacts with world-class universities. We will lose uh, opportunities to interact with high-class uh, scholars and researchers. We will lose opportunities to exchange students. I am a fundamental believer that science and education must be an open system. All borders, all frontiers we put up will render the system less efficient. And in this sense, I'm hoping that we will find a solution even in this difficult time so that the UK universities remain integrated in the scientific network in Europe. And there were some signs, there was obviously some hints in Theresa May's speech yesterday that she recognizes strength in science as being one of Britain's huge assets. There was hints that she may be able to find ways to negotiate where we still contribute to some European program. So, do you think there's enough optimism there that we, we might find a way to, to, to keep Britain engaged in the, in the European project in that sense? You know, as an engineer, I'm always optimistic. I know that there must be a solution. We have to find a work around these uh, difficult problems that are there. What this solution will look like, I think nobody knows yet. But what I can tell you is that me and I think all of my colleagues in Switzerland will be very open to find a solution which includes the UK universities as well. Across the world there does seem to be a populist rising against free movement of people, anti-immigration sentiment. Trump is being inaugurated as the president of America this week. How does America fit in with this and what does it mean for universities across the world that there's this rising tide that seems to be against globalization and against uh, immigration? First of all, one has to acknowledge, one has to recognize the fears of a large par part of the population. All these political movements that we see now, not just in the US, in Europe, in Asia and other parts of the world, they are based on a rational fear of a part of the population. And universities, in particular top class international universities, have to take, give an answer to these problems. It is not an easy problem, there won't be any easy answers, but we need to take these problems seriously. We cannot just say this is, uh, we have to shy away from it and say we don't care about it. Secondly, we must find a solution to this problem because otherwise we will not be able to keep up the high level of excellency that we have. As I said before, universities, particularly the top universities, live off an international relationship with every other good university. With boundaries, with frontiers, we will reduce the efficiency of the system, we will lose opportunities. Talent must flow freely in science in particular. And in this sense we have to bridge this difficult gap on one side making people who are insecure happier and on the other side try the best to keep the system open for global talent to really flow wherever it is best for them. One of the themes of Davos is of course responsible leadership. As a university leader, leading one of the best universities in the world, how do you see your role in this changing environment? I think this is one of the noblest cause that we have as a university. Seek truth and disseminate it. 
On the other side, we have to acknowledge the fact that maybe uh, what is denoted as the elite has detached itself too much from the basic strategies of society. And it is also a very important function and an important role of a world-class university is to overcome this gap and to talk to the general population, to talk to the people, the Joe on the street, and to try to explain to him that if we lose, if we leave this path of evidence-based politics, economics, education, whatever, we will only lose as a society, as a humanity. There is no alternative to enlightenment, there is no alternative to fact-based reasoning, and as universities we have two obligations, first of all advanced knowledge and second disseminate it in every part of the population. The ETH has a very strong and visible presence here at Davos. What are you actually doing here? Why are you here? We are exactly trying to do to fulfill our obligation that I mentioned before. On one side we interact with the elite of the universities. There's the Global University Leaders Forum meeting here in Davos within the WEF. So I talk to my colleagues, uh, vice chancellors, presidents of all universities, top class universities worldwide. We have this level of discussion. And the second one is we interact with the local population. We invite people from Davos, we invite people from all of the canton of Graubünden to come here to our location and to interact with us, see what we're doing in research and discuss problems they might have. It is again this two-pronged approach that I believe brings success. And finally, I think the... Uh Another key theme at Davos is the idea of the fourth industrial revolution, how that's going to change the world. How are universities positioned to respond to this fourth industrial revolution in terms of undergraduate teaching, graduate skills? Is ETH is at the forefront of digital and technological advancement. Where, where does your undergraduate teaching fit into all of that? These uh, developments in computational power, connectivity, everybody's connected with everyone, uh, brings a huge challenge, not only to universities, but also to universities. The value of knowledge, bare knowledge, memorizing, has been reduced over time. You, you have access through your iPhones to an enormous amount of information at no cost virtually. So the amount of knowing something, data, facts, is becoming less and less important. But the ability to interconnect facts, to be creative, to criticize existing positions, to be an entrepreneurial actor in this domain becomes more and more important. And this shift, I think, is a really challenging but also fascinating shift. As a top university, we have to make room for our students less on memorizing and more on creating project-based learning, interaction with humans, entrepreneurial action. This is a fantastic challenge that we are facing and I'm glad that many, many colleagues worldwide are taking up this challenge and I'm sure we will find exciting new approaches how to even better educate our students in future. As the leader of one of the world's very best universities, the world's most international university, do you have any secrets for success? What's the formula for being a world-class research university? There is no secret. Everybody knows it, but I'm going to tell you right now. Number one, you need money. This is trivial. Without resources, you cannot run a world-class university. But money is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Second one, we have talked before quite extensively, we need to be open. International contacts, exchange of students or faculty is key. Over 70% of our faculty members are not Swiss-born. And we believe that this is one of our most important ingredients to success. And the third one is autonomy. A university must decide by itself where to go, how to go there, what decisions to take. If these three ingredients come together and you give a university sufficient time, I believe you can make a very good university anywhere in the world. But of course it helps if you have a neighborhood like Davos in the background of yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much.